Hello everybody and thank you for joining. This is your host Nino and today we shall be having the second part of our legal deep dive into the EU Data Act. Now, before we do so, I would like to restate the three prolegomena from last time as they apply here to in the same fashion. First of all, this is not going to be a summary. This is going to be a detailed discussion of lots of aspects which I find noteworthy. So if you're just looking for a brief overview of the EU Data Act, this is not it. This is a more detailed uh, examination. Second of all, this is purely done as a project for the purpose of academic discussion. In other words, this does not constitute legal advice and you are encouraged to undertake your own legal evaluations. In fact, should you be having questions, comments, additions or corrections, I would be more than happy to have a discussion with you in the comment section. Third of all, this is done entirely personally and privately without any participation whatsoever of my employer. So all words expressed herein are just my own and are not to be attributed to my employer. So this is just Nino doing this, all right? Okay, and that said, last time we were having a look at the recitals, which in this case were really a lot. And what you will now see in the articles will be of little surprise, something like a reflection of the recitals. That is, the articles, of course, are constituting the actual legal obligations, but the recitals are giving them the necessary systematic and teleological guidance so that nobody plays funny, so to say, with some textual detail, but that it is clear in terms of a teleological interpretation how things are meant. And we start, you know, we will not go through each article, but we will just look at some more interesting ones. And we start with article one. So there is a wide scope to which the EU Data Act is applying, namely inter alia to manufacturers of products, suppliers of related services, to these products, so that's interesting that it's always mentioned that the services be related to the products. Data holders, data recipients, right? So it is also applying to the users who would like to have some data and so on and so forth, or third parties which shall receive data. Providers of data processing services. Now this one is really interesting. What happens if you're having an entity which itself is not really keeping the data, but just providing an environment in which other parties can process the data. So these are the providers of data processing services and public bodies requesting data based on exceptional need, <laughs> which as we already mentioned in the previous video and as we shall see later on here is not all that exceptional. <laughs> So this, this is triggered rather easily. And it is also mentioned that police and criminal prosecution matters remain unaffected and subject to their own legislation. Now, having said that, unsurprisingly, as is often the case, follow the definitions. There are lots of definitions. I just simply picked a couple which might be interesting for you in particular. I shall read them here. Data has a broad definition and is including audiovisual material, which is going to be interesting from my perspective in the future, as there might be intellectual property discussions regarding that. So data is a broad concept. And keep in mind, we are talking here of personal and non personal data, which is just simply generated by the use of something. So this gives the whole thing an extra flair of complexity when you think about, for instance, copyright and artificial intelligence, which is generating certain contents where you're saying, yeah, but there is no copyright possible to be attributed to a person because this is not a work. 
due to a lack of um, compositional effort or complexity so that no person has really participated in the creation. But nonetheless, such data would be data generated by the use of a system and very well should fall, in my opinion, under the data term of this regulation. Then we're having the definition of the data holder. Now that's really interesting because that is just someone with the ability to make available certain data. In other words, it's not necessarily someone where the data is locally stored with. So it does not need to be someone who has the data in his physical possession. It would be sufficient that it is someone who can make some system somewhere else spit out certain data. And that is quite a different concept than we have seen, for instance, um, more or less underlying previous regulations, including, by the way, the GDPR. So then we are having the user, which is a natural or legal person, mm -hmm, so not only a natural person, that owns, rents or leases a product or receives a service. What does it mean to receive a service? And from my perspective, this might give rise to further questions when you're having some sort of on behalf usage and that contractual relationships among the providers and users of a service might not really be matching the relationships expected by this regulation because the person who receives a service might not be actually the contract holder but nonetheless be a user pursuant to this regulation. So if you imagine, for instance, a school which is contracting for the receipt of some certain service might be the contracting entity, but the pupils actually might be the users, although they themselves, no pupil himself or herself, is holding a contract to whatever service provider there is. Then we're having functional equivalence. This is lovely because I am really curious about it, you know, like will, how will that be established in practice? It means the maintenance of a minimum level of functionality, whatever functionality now means, right? In the environment after the switching on core elements, the destination service will deliver the same output at the same performance and with the same level of security, operational resilience and quality of service as the original service. So I don't see that in any way as minimum. I see this as actually quite far reaching and I am not sure whether the establishment of so-called functional equivalence is something that has been quite practically thought through for these are lots of demands to raise for who, whoever the service provider is. I mean, my, my favorite pet peeve, transfer your LinkedIn profile to Facebook. <laughs> How will you do that? You don't have the same groups. You do not have, you cannot transfer the friend list, which is sort of the main thing you have in a social network. You may be able to transfer some own postings but where on the on your own profile wall and so on and so forth. So this functional equivalence is a little bit in my perception, maybe gonna be a pipe dream, but let's see. Also things like security, operational resilience, quality of service and so on and so forth. These are infrastructural topics in many degrees of the service provider. This isn't even something which is so much a question between the service provider and the user. So if one entity has a certain setup, which gives it a certain uptime, certain reliability and so on and so forth, this entity will not be in a position to impose that setup on other entities. And evidently then the other entities will have their own setup with their own uptime security backup and whatnot. And so evidently there will be different figures. So this, this is going to be difficult. But now let's continue to the 
making of data accessible. <laughs> so, products shall be designed and manufactured, and these are somehow two different things, right? <laughs> and related services, again, not abstract services, but related services, shall be provided in such a manner that data generated by their use are by default easily, securely, and where relevant and appropriate, whatever that means, directly accessible to the user. Plus, moreover, I added pre-contractual information duties on the character of access to and use of the data. The identity of the data holder, so not just categories of data users, and this is a sort of improvement over the GDPR, and the means of communication, which is not surprising, and in my view, this is like uh, a website or media imprint. And the right to lodge a complaint, which we have already seen in the GDPR in a very similar fashion. But what does that mean? Like, what does a where relevant and appropriate mean? So you, you realize there are these qualifiers which sort of lead to legal uncertainty, where you cannot say, has the right to, but, but where appropriate. And then you yourself can think whether someone using, I don't know, a private aircraft should have access to all the data generated by some engine, for instance, or the, some, some consumption of, of fuel or things like that. So maybe yes, or maybe for Security reasons, for instance, no. If you say that there might be something endangering the operation, that you say if, if certain things are known, then maybe somebody can, can easier mess with it. I mean, as you see, I am a bit struggling to understand that qualifier of relevant and appropriate. All right, on to Article 4, making the data actually available to the user. So the data must be made available to the user electronically where feasible. Hmm. Where not, it still must be made available then manually, but free of charge and without limitation as to how often the data may be requested. So this is not like the requests for information under the GDPR where you can say, my God, that's a nuisance and why is some data subject requesting her or his data so often, but it is more like, well, the make of means of electronically accessing that. And if you don't have it, yeah, then you will have to suffer giving it manually and free of charge. Moreover, it can be understood this way that Article 4 says that trade secrets must be disclosed too, if they are part of the data and only protective measures and confidentiality obligations may, may be imposed to a certain degree, but the provision of the data may not be outright denied. So you can't say, oh my God, there is a trade secret connected, so I'm not giving you your data. Yes, you are. Here, however, you're having of course, uh, interesting question, what data is really personal and what is just machine generated and not personal? And for personal data, the GDPR remains applicable and leaving you with the legal risk of judging whether some data is personal or not. The use of non-personal data by the data holder is only permitted on the basis of a contractual agreement with the user. So you do not have legitimate interests as in the GDPR, at least none are mentioned. And that of course may quite throw up some questions regarding the usefulness of this data. Like what are you allowed to do with it as a data holder and what limitations can you in fact even impose on the user without these limitations being judged as going too far and improperly limiting the usage rights on the data. You are also not allowed to use the data to undermine the economic 
situation of the user, uh, like as a data holder. And here the question is what happens, uh, not to undermine, but to determine, I mean, <laughs> to determine the economic situation of the user. And, and that, of course, raises the question of, is this the death of shopping carts, where evidently all sorts of supermarkets try exactly to determine what sort of buyer you are, which category of products you will rather prefer. Are you rather the person who is buying the expensive champagne or the cheap booze? So uh, these things will, will be having an interesting future. Now, that thing with the agreement with the user, I really do wonder how that will play out with technical interoperability. Because sometimes some things need an automatic reply. Imagine pinging a server, evidently you want to get a ping echo. And do you now have to make a contractual agreement with everyone where you would like to direct a ping towards? I mean, you do realize the absurdity of this. So let's say the law in its letter here may be imposing limitations which are a little bit too far reaching. Speaking, by the way, of um, <laughs> funny limitations and um, and determinations, you as a data holder may, of course, verify the quality as a user and to decide thereupon whether a person should have access to data or not. However, you're not allowed to use any further identification than to determine the quality of a person being a system user. So you cannot be asking now for address, registration, passport copies and whatnot. I find that clearly a progress because in the past, in particular shady entities where you're near certain that they are obtaining your data illegally, we're using that against users by saying, oh, give me a passport copy, then I'll tell you where your data is coming from. And <laughs> you certainly don't want to do that. And now it has been I think advantageously regulated that this may not be demanded. Now, the next article is actually quite interesting and treats a somewhat related matter. This is the right of users to share data with third parties. So that is a somewhat different approach from each system provider telling the user, well, take your data and do with it whatever you want. Here, instead, the draft foresees that one system provider, by the order of its user, is transferring said user's data to another system provider and that the user may indeed request this. So that is going to be interesting because it is necessitating further contractual relationships. Evidently, the one system provider will need to have some form of contract with the other system provider in order to facilitate such a data transfer. And payment to this is also interesting because it may not be required from the user directly, but rather if the old system provider is transferring data to the new system provider, the old system provider is assumed to request payment by the new system provider but the new system provider has no other way to reimburse its costs than through the user. So we're having again that situation where the new system provider might even be tempted to simply channel such costs to the user, and not even negotiate them very much. So what does Article 5 foresee? It foresees the, the data sharing by the data holder with a third party upon the request of the user and the data must be transferred in the same quality as the data holder has it available for him or herself. Where applicable, and we don't know where it is applicable, so that's, that's an indeterminate legal term, the data sharing shall occur continuously and in real time. So that's not like in the GDPR where the requests for information are point in time occurrences, but this is supposed to be continuous. Identification, just like for receiving the data as a user, 
in the same way also for having data transferred, shall only be done as far as necessary to qualify the person as a system user. So again, the data holder can't just go ahead and demand a passport copy, okay? Then the data holder shall not use the non-personal data to derive insights about the economic situation, assets, and production methods that could undermine the commercial position of the third party without its consent. I mean, when you think about that, this is, of course, an, a funny provision, right? So you can say the evident aim is this. If you want to have user data transferred from one database to another database, then maybe through the technical details, you may, as a, as a system operator, gain insight into the processes, facilities, and economic situation of the new system provider. Who is your competitor here, right? Like this new provider is taking away your user and your user data. And so you would evidently have a little bit of a motivation to figure out what is he or she doing better. But you are not uh, allowed to derive insights about that from these data transfers. And because of course you will not stop being in competition, you will try to somehow figure out why can, for instance, the new service be provided cheaper or more reliably and so on and so forth. And that's going to create strong conflicts of interest and legal risks and difficulties to explain why suddenly you restructured your, your pricing after 20 users transferred their data and so on and so forth. So don't underestimate the uh, explosive force this may bear. Then, trade secrets shall be disclosed only as far as necessary. This is going throughout the entire regulation as a principle. You can't use trade secrets to deny opening up the data. And, no, it is really great, right? For personal data, the GDPR continues to be applicable. And if the user is not a data subject, it shall only, uh, such data shall only be made available under the GDPR rules. And here you're getting into a complete legal mess of overlapping rules of who is user of a system, who is old and new provider, who is controller of data, who is data processor, who is a data subject in the data protection sense and, and <laughs> And the mapping of these roles, it's, it's essentially a cross mapping between the between these, which I mentioned, and these new definitions of a um, processing service provider, of a data holder, of a user, and, and to see who shall be responsible with what. Oh boy, that's gonna be a task. And then the third party shall not coerce or trick its access to the data of the data holder. So old ones shall not spy on the new one to figure out its economic situation and so on and so forth. But the new one shall also not use some form of loopholes or trickery in order to get data from the old one. So he desperately, the European Commission is trying to uphold the principles of fair competition. and big and supposedly evil corporations, which the European Commission is calling gatekeepers, shall be prohibited from receiving data under this provision. And here I see also total legal risks because once you get data out of a system, it no longer has a mark. How would a gatekeeper even know where data is coming from? If, if the user is supplying the data holder with such data. So let's see, say this is again one of those provisions where I understand the goodwill more than the practical and systematic realization possibilities. And such companies referred to as gatekeepers, that is big and evil companies, forgive me the ironic note, shall not be 
even soliciting users to try and make available data to them. So you see, we are having here a completely new and parallel regime to other things we have known so far, in particular the GDPR and its request for information requirements and so on and so forth, where these two laws are applicable in parallel and have potentially lots of overlappings. Not to mention there is a certain potential for data laundering, if I may use such an expression. That is, if you can't get new data, maybe uh, you can create some form of service which when fed with old data is generating further data. So that's not the original data, that's new data, but it is in, in essence the old data having been reworked. So if you look at it formally, it's not the old data anymore. And maybe such data laundering <laughs> possibility will also launch debates on where to data must be transferred, may be transferred, shall be or shall not be transferred and so on and so forth. All right, now that we were looking at the data holder and uh, the user's rights of, of receiving data and the transferring data, it is also time that we look at Article 6 and the obligations of third-party data recipients, so the new service providers, relating to data received through the Articles 4 and 5, which we just looked at. There are, by the way, some exceptions for, uh, for that under Article 7 relating to small and medium enterprises, unless they are in partnership with large enterprises something I see critical because you're essentially punishing small companies for being in a relationship with large companies, which however oftentimes will prevent them from growing or establishing themselves. Like there are many companies which started as complete little servicing dwarfs of giants and then grew to a respectable size by themselves. And by making the exception dependent on that, you're cutting away a lot of their market. It is of course all made to punish the big entities, but you're really having here a lot of collateral um, damage, if you ask me. Anyway, let's look at these obligations of the new service providers. So, in so far as personal data is being transferred, you are having here a parallel regime with the GDPR. And that's gonna be also throwing interesting questions as the GDPR, normally foresees fewer limitations on data handling. I can't believe I just said that, <laughs> but, but so it is. Like the GDPR in this regard is a little bit cleaner than, than, than this thing here. Then data may only be used for the purposes and under the conditions agreed with the user. And the data is to be deleted when the data is are no longer necessary for the agreed purpose. So what you do not have here are related purposes, right? The GDPR sometimes allows you to use data for related purposes, even though not the same, nor do you have here legitimate interests as the GDPR would be foreseeing. So you're having here only contractual conditions in practice, I imagine this is gonna be just more clicky banners, right? Because that's the only way the internet is nowadays really expressing these contractual conclusions. And then there are various prohibitions imposed relating to the third party's conduct. So the third party shall not be tricking or coercing the user to give it data, including through a digital interface and this must be exactly relating to the website banners I just mentioned. You know how stupid they look oftentimes with uh, the agree option being large and green and the other option being somehow dysfunctional or grayed out or uh, manage preferences leading you straight into a labyrinth or something equally inane. And instead, it is said here, um, no, don't do that, you know. So the GDPR did not make that as obvious. They were more or less just speaking of the free consent. But here, 
the tricking element and the coercing element are just more blatantly stated. And I believe that this is going to have a collateral effect on legal practice in general regarding such consent banners. Now, the data shall also not be used for the profiling of natural persons. All right, so you're the new service provider, you're getting that data and you're not supposed to profile the natural persons who give you that data. So here again, I see some businesses are going to be in hot water. You shall also not be making the data available to gatekeepers. Yeah, this is fun because of course it would be a too easy circumvention, right? So you give the data to a dwarf and the dwarf gives the data to the gatekeeper. Wow. <laughs> So, however, that would be perhaps one of these applications of potential data laundering, in my view. Because, all right, so the new service provider gets the data, does not make it available to the evil, evil gatekeeper, but generates from the received data new data, has it in his contractual terms with the user that this new data shall be created, and then maybe somehow makes that new data available. Let, let's see whether something like that might become a topic. And yeah, unless this is, this, this is exactly now fitting, unless this, it, it, this is necessary to provide the service requested by the user, but the user usually will not request anything beyond clicking a button offered, the third party shall not make the data available to further third parties but it will be 100% written in order to serve you this content. You must agree that we make your data available to Australia or whatever, where you are really wondering why is it going there. But by clicking the button, you will be providing your request and they will be duly fulfilling it. Also, now that one I find strange regarding the telos of the whole thing. The third party shall not be using the data for the creation of a competing product. Well, that's murderous, right? I mean, you want that new service providers can appear, challenge the old ones for their place in the market, maybe offer better services and be selected by users. However, once they receive data from you, they shall be prohibited to use that for the creation of a competing product. That's not even something which the GDPR is requiring. So that's a very strange limitation from my perspective, which is going centrally against the purposes of this regulation otherwise, and um, is also bearing the legal risk, which I already mentioned, that data has no markings. Somebody got some data, developed a competing product, and then it turned out it has been, for instance, the same data as a person has transferred into his systems previously. And then, whoopsie daisy, did you now use that data? And can you prove that you did not use that data for the creation of the competing product or not? So again, this is somehow looking like a weird sort of compromise or mediocre solution, which I am not sure how exactly it will be applying in practice because it has because it is oozing legal disk all over, okay? And speaking of obligations, 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 let's look at those for the data holders in Article 8. So, data holders shall make their data available under fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, which for, moreover shall be transparent. Their... Uh, opposing unfair contractual terms, so if a data holder decides how oh, I just won't do that, shall be non-binding on the targeted contractual party. So not, not bilaterally non-binding, just unilaterally non-binding on the other one. Partners shall not be favored. Though then again, I mean, why are they partners, right? <laughs> But okay, partners shall not be favored. And I see that as quite a deep ingression into the arrangements of the parties, right? 
exclusivity of data provision shall only be permitted if it is so requested by the user. A little bit of a weird stipulation in my view, because if data can only made, be made available to third parties by request of the user, then evidently the user should be controlling that whether it is happening exclusively or not. So why mention it separately? But maybe I'm missing here something. And then <laughs> again, there shall be no obligation to disclose trade secrets. And now it comes unless the disclosure is required by the law, including parts of, like for instance, Article 6, this regulation. So in other words, this is so stamped with holes that again, you can't deny effectively disclosure based on ideas of trade secrets, really. I find particularly this situation around the trade secrets a little bit unfulfilling because it is not really clear, like what secrecy measures may data be subjected to in order to be protected as a trade secret, who is challenging that how, and when would be restrictions going too far? When would you say that actually you cannot restrict the data provision because that itself would then be an unfair term? By the way, we're having a really funny situation. I forgot to mention that previously, but so I shall mention it here. You remember I told you that when data is being provided to a user or in the name of a user to a third party, said user may be identified by the data holder as a user of the system, but not beyond that. And so therefore that identification is limited. You know where this does not work? Well, when the user gets a straight no, because then the user would have to go to to court, to the authority, to a settlement body or something like that. And then evidently you would have to say who you are when you're lodging that complaint. So in one way or the other, the disclosure of the identity of the user will happen at the latest when the user undertakes legal steps, because that simply is how courts are working. They want to know who the parties are. So full anonymity is really not guaranteed by this regulation at all. Maybe also not exactly its aim. One can say if it goes so far that there is a legal dispute, then the names of the parties, of course, may be known. Now let's get to a topic I already mentioned to you, namely compensation. And compensation to the data holder for making the data available may be required from the data recipient, not the user and not both, up to the data holder's own costs. And these need to be detailed, they need to be transparent and reasonable and so on and so forth. So I still see reimbursement from the user as likely because if the third party has to pay in order to get the data, very likely the third party will not just sit on that money payment and hope that the new services will become somehow economically reasonable, but is more than likely to charge immediately the user in terms of providing the service. And it's going to say, look, I paid to your old data holder a hundred euro. I'm now providing you a service. I would like to have these hundred euro back. By the way, the new service costs 20. So it's not so that they're just going to request 20, 20, 20 and hope at some point with the profit to equalize. But in the end, the user will have to pay my frank view. Then article 10 is uh, handling dispute resolution and access to courts is unaffected. You may go to the settlement bodies which are supposed to be instituted, but you do not have to. And that is actually quite a similar idea to other setups in the sphere of consumer protection where such settlement bodies are not unheard of. Now progressing to article 11, technical protection measures and provisions on unauthorized use or disclosure of data, well, that's going to be, I think, quite interesting and, and perhaps leading to certain legal discussions as the data holder may impose technical protection measures. 
but they may not hinder the user to provide data to third parties. Oh, I see that as, <laughs> as an interesting question in and of itself. As you may remember, these disputes which in particular arose with regard to DVDs and later DRM and so on and so forth. So when such content is protected, you're supposed to not circumvent these protections, right? At the same time, in many to not say most jurisdictions, it is actually permitted to copy a work, certainly so in Germany and Austria, in order to give it, for instance, to close friends and something like that. But then the DRM measures are preventing you and you would be then supposed to somehow ask for the provision of, an, of, of such a copy that you could distribute to your friends. You'll never hear back from anybody. And essentially this right to copy is thereby annihilated. And that has led to quite some discussions in the past, in particular because of an extra tax which in Austria is being levied on, and in Germany is being levied on um, data carriers. I'm not sure about Germany, but in Austria, definitely. <laughs> and this extra fee is going actually to the, uh, to entities representing artists, because one is saying, look, a fraction, of the price of the USB stick should go to them because media is going to be put on that USB stick. So far so good, but you're prohibiting the user through the usage of DRM measures to actually make that copy. And here it is said that the uh, technical protection measures and provisions on unauthorized use may not hinder the user to provide the, the data to third parties. So what's gonna be the future of such measures? Do keep in mind that in the beginning I told you that this regulation does also um, relate to audiovisual works. So I believe there might be some interesting questions arising in that regard. And also, there is a really funny murky issue here and a possible reading of a section of Article 11, which I shall present you with. And we will see in the future whether that reading is actually correct. So if a data recipient indeed has deceived or coerced the data holder into providing data and maybe has made available data for unauthorized purposes or has illegitimately given data to third parties, then he shall delete the data and make that offering based on the knowledge from this illegitimately gained or transferred data unavailable, unless, and now this is really funny, the use of the data has not caused significant harm to the data holder, weird that the data holder is mentioned and not other persons like the user, or would be disproportionate. So you're having something like a, a restrained punitive clause here. So on the one hand, um, you shall not enjoy the fruits of your illicit act, but you shall enjoy the fruits of your illicit act if it would be disproportionate for, for, to forbid you from doing so. <laughs> this is so, so weird to regulate it this way, like either make a true punitive clause or just let it be and, and let it be determined proportionately, but to have it like halfway punitive as it is, as it is here, is really weird. And then we are having, yeah, Article 12, a broad voidance of unfair contractual terms used by data holders, ex lege voidance. And that, of course, relates to what I told you in the beginning when we were starting to look at this folio, that you shall not be hindering the user to provide the data to third parties, so maybe hindering the user and, and saying you may not circumvent this and that, is that even then a valid term? Or may the user maybe just happily hack away? Hmm? <laughs> will, will be interesting to see in the future. Now, speaking of unfair terms, 
Let us progress to Article 13 and unfair contractual terms unilaterally imposed on a micro, small or medium-sized enterprise. It is really lovely to talk about unilaterally imposed because you immediately imagine how this company is squashing them under its boot. But in the reality is not quite such because after all it is a contract. And well, uh, that will remain to be seen how that is used in practice. But the idea is that such terms shall not be binding on the small and medium enterprise. And they are like this, this stipulation is mainly aiming at terms excluding liability in cases of gross negligence and intentional acts, as well as non-performance limitation of remedies preventing obtaining and using data and so on and so forth. And, and these are a couple of concepts which are quite mixed, some of them being completely understandable, others being rather questionable. And, and this is again something where you're having legal uncertainty. So excluding liability in cases of gross negligence and intentional acts is something which pretty much every jurisdiction has some form of defense against. In other words, you cannot actually dress a t-shirt on which it is written no liability and take a baseball bat and destroy a, a row of cars without consequence. It just does not work that way, all right? So that will normally be challenged at least as being contra bonus mores, if not something else. So it's lovely that this is regulated here, but this is really something which is already known throughout most jurisdictions, if not all. Then, non-performance. Well, evidently you can't just not perform your, your part of the contract and still demand the money, although you could perform, right? That is also something which most jurisdictions will recognize as um, something which even without this regulation would be unacceptable. Now you may have here moments of dispute whether it was really impossible for the service provider to provide its services and whether that rem remedy should even work. Because you could say that there are cases of force majeure where your service provider is trying so not sitting idly, but trying to re-establish services. So it is still serving you, just in a somewhat different way. Like let's say the volcano exploded un underneath its data center. You're not accessing right now your cloud service, but your service provider is trying to engage a replacement data center to continue serving you. So it's not sitting idly and waiting for the volcano explosion to just go over, but it is doing something. And in such cases, it would be sort of unfair to say that this is a non-provision of service. So this is not a non-performance, this is just a case of a different performance. But in practice, you usually are having the disputes on whether it's impossible to provide services. Now this weather is, is exactly usually the crux and it also depends on the contractual arrangement because if you have explicitly agreed to something being a case of force majeure, then, the, then it is really hard to challenge that as inapplicable suddenly. Like you just said beforehand that that would be, that that would be such a case, right? Well, then uh, if you, however, then look at the limitation of remedies, the question becomes more complex because not every remedy makes sense to every product or service. If you are having, in particular, mass products and mass services, then a re-performance might just not make sense. Because if you said that a product or a related service was not working in the first place, then the re-performance, very likely, will not work either. So, in such cases, service providers are quite often telling you that all you can get back is the money you paid for that. So it does not work for you, that's fine, you get your money back, nobody's robbing you, but nobody's going to adjust a service for 20,000 people because it doesn't work for you, right? So the limitation of remedies is not necessarily 
an unfair condition. And then you're having, and that's going to be also flaring up disputes in my view, the preventing obtaining and using data. So what is a legitimate security measure or legitimate confidentiality measure under which data is provided to you? And what is an illegitimate prevention on the use of data? And I think that's going to be a gray area which is going to trigger a lot of disputes. Well, then you're having even something quite funny. Article 13 contains something like a quasi ex lege imposed sort of clausula salvatoria. So to say that the rest of the contract remains valid. That's also not necessarily something which the parties want. Now, if you have a contract for a complete solution, you might not want to be bound to it, even though it is objectively imagining to work with only part of the arrangement. And you might just want to say, if anything in this is void, then we go apart, we divorce, and nobody is upset. But if you're having such an ex lege clausula salvatoria, you might be binding parties to a contract where one party wouldn't want to perform only part of, of the whole arrangement. So it's weird to see a clausula salvatoria in a law and it is understandable why it is there because otherwise you might have a complete contract voidance. But, but I'm not sure that this is going to be something that parties will desire. But maybe it is simply regulated by declaring that no part of this contract is separable and if anything is invalid, then the whole thing is invalid. So I believe that this is not going to be such a big problem in practice. However, I have seen such situations in the past and I can tell you it's not at all easy to void a contract because oftentimes you're depending on a product or service. So you realize something is not working very well and you could void the contract. However, when you do so, you blow up your own business. I call this riding the atomic bomb. So you have a legal remedy, but you can't use it. You're like Major Kong in uh, Dr. Strangelove or how I stopped worrying and learned to love the bomb, right? So, so it's not sure that you're going to meet such a legal measure with all that much enthusiasm as Major Kong did. Now, when is anything unilaterally imposed? It's not actually being said. And one may very well derive the conclusion that minimal negotiation or minimal contract configuration makes the whole thing no longer unilateral, which of course would motivate large service providers to have a set of clauses where they do allow modification. So it's not a complete take it or leave it contract, but just all the more key fixed limitations on other clauses. And so this thing of saying everything needs to be negotiable may not penetrate such structures the way the commission is imagining and that not because the service providers or product producers manufacturers are evil but because you're dealing with mass products and mass services so a certain contextual configuration likely will be possible and the rest will be simply cast in iron and it is as buying a ticket for the train you you don't get to select the material of the rails. You just get to reserve a place and look out of the window. So it is. <laughs> and then you are having uh, an element of legal uncertainty, namely what limitations on liability performance, etc., are appropriate. So this relates to everything I told you before that, and, and that succinctly, succinctly puts it together that some things must be appropriate because otherwise the provision of services and the delivery of products will be impossible. But what it is, well, I believe we will have to see that a little bit in practice. All right, now, 
on to something completely different. Now, let me remind you that we are talking here also of machine generated data. And through machine generated data, you can of course draw a lot of conclusions on the backgrounds and ways of setup and so on of the systems. And here now come a lot of provisions where data needs to be supplied by companies to EU institutions, uh, stipulated in articles 14 and 4 following, which are, however, rather snoopy. I mean, you know, Europeans are always saying, oh my God, this and that about the United States of America as being snoopy. But now you are having a regulation which is even snoopier. Like, it, it's really funny because it looks like the stance wasn't so much moral about getting the data, but more like plague it by envy. Why should only they have the data? We want the data. And, <laughs> and, and that regulation which you're now seeing here and which I shall get into the details of, this regulation is demanding such data transfers which look even out of place. Like, you will see we are very far away from just preventing data, uh, just procuring data in case of emergency. So it's not always like, I don't know, who is a subscriber to the electrical company in case of a storm so you know where to look for people. Like something like that would be perhaps somehow imaginable. But what you will now see is that data is being requested in a way that is quite transgressing boundaries. All right, so these disclosure obligations shall not be applicable to small and medium enterprises. Data shall be provided in connection with a public emergency. All right, so far so fine. But then, um, in case an institution is unable to obtain such data by alternative means, also fine so far, or, and now it gets interesting and problematic, why or, or it would substantially reduce the administrative burden for data holders, or, again, one of these deadly ors, other enterprises. So this is ridiculous. That actually no longer has any necessary connection to a public emergency in any strict sense, right? Because if the data is not to be provided in, a, in, in case of a public emergency, but just because that would be substantially reducing the administrative burden of some sort of enter, enterprise or entity, then you're not wanting the data as an EU institution. You're wanting the data simply because you want the data. <laughs> and I mean, because they're argue, arguing here with the uh, a reduction of the administrative burden, while Article 18 would allow you to decline or seek a modification of the request within five working days of receiving it, I wonder how that can be challenged. Like that is such a such an uncertain and such a broad term. They can always say, oh "My gosh, my man, it does reduce my administrative duty. I do want to have your data. I would otherwise have to develop all of these things myself." But the sweetness continues. So you have provided the data, right? And Article 19 says that the EU institution shall not use the data in a manner incompatible with the purpose for which they, that is the data, were requested. That is a use for related purposes is absolutely allowed. And that's different from the regulation which is imposed, imposed on private parties. Private parties do not have such luxury. Private parties may only use the data pursuant to the contractual agreement with the user. There are no related purposes there, but the state institution has them. Article 20 further specifies that the EU institution is supposed, or national institution, is supposed to get the data free of charge or only for the own costs of the data holder, which he then have, has the pleasure of detailing. 
and article 21 also permits scientific research or analysis by the public body. In other words, under some guise of emergency, data may be required by the data holder and then may be used for the not unrelated purpose of scientific research by some other European body. And if some foreign enterprise would interpret that as possible economic espionage, I wouldn't be too surprised, right? Like, like, dear, I don't know, some, some, some southern or eastern company, please give us our da your data. Oh, that's very interesting. Aha, uh -huh, these are the, this is the structure of, of the, I don't know, database, neural network, or whatever you are using. Now let's do a little bit of European research on that. Okay, let's do a couple of publications. And now our own companies are using that without having to bother with you and get patents and whatnot. So, <laughs> uh, that that is maybe a little bit concerning for the enterprises which have to deliver the data. All right, now, let's look at articles 23 and 4 following, which concern switching between data processing services. And you would think that Prima facie, there's nothing wrong with that, right? So one had one data processing service, then one shall have another one as a user. Okay, that's great. It is demanded that termination should be possible within 30 calendar days. So that a user is not being bound for longer periods of time. I understand that. Um, what this does not, however, regulate is what happens with the payment. So, if in the past a service provider was telling you, you may quit with a termination period of six months, and during these six months pay 120, okay, like 20 euro per month or something, and then now, <laughs> the user has to be able to terminate within 30 days. Okay, cool. But nobody is actually prohibiting the service provider from still requiring 120. And that might not even be an unfair term because you can say that the provision and termination of a service is, of course, um, causing certain internal setup necessities. And, and so... Okay, you get a shorter termination pre period, you're out of the contract faster. But that does not mean that your payment for that will necessarily decrease, right? Then the porting of data should be possible. It's so sweet because that is being regulated time and again. Like data portability was already a topic in the GDPR. But okay, here it is again. And now comes something which is really weird the maintaining of functional equivalence. So the new service shall be functionally equivalent to the old service. However, that's oftentimes an infrastructural topic and really nothing which an old service provider can in any way influence. How shall the old service provider warrant functional equivalence at the new service provider? Like that's really beyond me. And it just keeps getting better and better. <laughs> better meaning worse. You're having here also Article 24 regarding min the minimum required contractual terms between providers of data processing services. And <laughs> they shall allow the customer to switch within 30 calendar days to another cloud provider. Okay or an on-premise system, okay. And to port all data applications and digital assets generated directly or indirectly by the customer. Notice that this is only the stuff generated by the customer. It does not mean 
that applications which were part of the service environment need to be portable. So if there was an awesome application which you used to administrate your data or processes with, this awesome application may very well stay in the old service and have no equivalent in the new service, right? And data retrieval shall be possible at least 30 days after this transition period. So we are talking really here about the 60 days period, like 30 days in order to um, terminate plus 30 days to get your data out. And then comes the completely delusional requirement that the old here provider shall ensure full continuity in the provision of the respective functions or services. I don't see him able to do that. <laughs> okay, like how shall, how shall that be insurable in a foreign enterprise? Like assume the old provider was having all sorts of disaster recovery measures and supplemental electrical supply and whatnot, and it's all transferred into an on-premise system of the user and the user just hopes nobody will stumble over the cable. <laughs> okay, so, in this situation, I just think that this is not a stipulation that can be practically fulfilled by any provider. And I would be surprised if that really remains that way in the final draft. But let's see. Let's see what the future will bring, right? And then again, the aim shall be that no extra monetary charges shall be demanded for the switching. I mean, this is again, you know, when you go for such economical terms, the only thing you are reaching normally is a reconfiguration and not really, and not really disposal of the charges. Charges are truly reduced by competition. When you're having a new and upcoming cloud provider, it usually offers better terms, both financially and contractually than the older established cloud providers, and that way costs are reduced. If you now say that no costs can be, no extra charges can be demanded for the switching, great, then any eventual switching fee which may have existed will be dropped, but the price of the service will be increased by 5% <laughs> and, and the user will pay it anyway, right? So lovely, but in my view, ultimately pointless. But also more general affair with this entire article 24 actually. See, what are the minimum required terms between providers of data processing services? Do they assume each provider has a contractual relationship to each other provider? Now we spoke that evidently they may need to enter into uh, contractual relationships should the user require data to be transferred from an old provider to a new provider rather than the user just downloading his or her data and then uploading them separately. So in such cases that may be going on without a contract but normally if, if, if the transfer is ordered they would have to enter into relationships but that really then has the effect of creating a whole mesh of relationships between all sorts of service providers uh, <laughs> I don't know whether that is great. I, I have severe doubts that that's a very good idea. All right, and now let's have a look at technical aspects of switching. So what is being established here? Well, providers of data processing services that concern scalable and elastic computing resources limited to infrastructural elements. I shall come back to that in a second. Such as servers, networks, and so on and so forth, shall ensure how that the customer after switching enjoys functional equivalence in the use of the new service. And all other providers of data processing services shall make open interfaces available publicly and free of charge. And finally, European interoperability standards must be followed if available, and if such do not exist or do not exist yet, 
than structured commonly used and machine readable formats shall be used for the data exchange. Now the late letter thing is really lovely because it does not tell that the formats are user selected. So as if, if the customer wants it in, let's say some spreadsheet to be transferred in, in XLS and the provider says, no, sorry, I'm just offering CSV, then there is no way to, to challenge the CSV thing, right? However, now going up a little bit, uh, regarding this, the interfaces, one may of course ask to what depth and what happens if the provider only has limited information on the interfaces? Like, is that then going to be requiring the provider to ensure in the background the availability of such interfaces or would that only relate to interfaces supplied by the provider itself? For in the first case, that would also again lead to a little bit of a contractual mess because let's say the provider would have then to contact who knows how many companies in the background in order to be able to provide their interface information to the user. So that's also a topic. And the first thing, the thing we started with, shows you also a clear contradiction. So on the one hand, it's somebody who is providing infrastructural elements that is not functional elements really, it's infrastructural elements and this entity shall, in, shall ensure functional equivalence but they are pro providing the infrastructure rather than the functions, right? So how shall somebody who is just providing you a processor and some disk space and some RAM make sure that your new database is working as well as the previous database, right? So you, you see the contradiction in this. And I understand that the background idea must have been that um, entities which are providing mere infrastructure shall not, so to say, crappify it just because you change the, pro the provider. So to prevent infrastructure providers from sort of forcing you to enter into or keep in contracts which en with entities uh, ju just so you do not suffer a decrease of performance. So that somebody tells you, I don't know, stream your videos through this service because if you stream your videos through the other service, then I'm going to decrease the bandwidth to 10% of what you had previously available, right? That would be highly discouraging. And that I understand but they can ensure functional equivalence only in relation to the infrastructure, not really in relation to the service. So what I mean is, if they do not de decrease, in my example, your video bandwidth, but simply your new streaming provider is streaming movies in higher quality, so it permanently stops because it needs to load and load and it's unbearable to watch, then it should be actually judged that your service provider did nothing wrong. He continues to give you, uh, uh, I don't know, eight megabit connection, which is nowadays a little bit slim. <laughs> and, and that it does not work for watching 4K videos is not actually his mistake. So let's see how this is going to be working in the practice, but this functional equivalence thing is going to be very interesting. However, maybe it will be all diffused by the European standards. Because after all, the European Union has no interest in, in creating a law which would be unlivable, <laughs> like impracticable. And, and so I suspect that all these things may be just clarified on the technical level, as admittedly they are hard to grasp on a legal level. All right, and once again to something completely different, but very interesting, I think, namely international data, international access and transfer of non-personal data. Keep in mind the ping echo. So you, uh, as, a, as a data holder, uh, the data holder has to prevent international transfer or governmental access to non-personal data held in the European Union where such transfer or access would create a conflict with union law or the national law 
of the relevant main member state. I do ask myself why that is written there, because that's a matter of course. Why regulate it? It's basically saying if it is forbidden to transfer the data, then we forbid you to transfer the data. The first rule of tautology club is the first rule of tautology club. But then it gets really interesting. Regarding the recognition of foreign disclosure judgments, so somebody outside wants to see the data, that is going to be only possible if there is an international agreement or, or mutual legal assistance treaty in place. Okay, clear so far, but now it comes. Otherwise, it is also possible to transfer the data into the um, foreign country if that is proportionate and there is proper legal process in place, not necessarily public legal process, proper legal process. So, to put it bluntly, certain national security tribunals, which are always being criticized in the United States, they are a proper legal process quite possibly under this. Like, why not? It's a civilized country after all. Not everything is public, all right. But that's not demanded. And if one is unsure, one may ask the authorities for guidance. Again, I believe the weakness of this is that it has not completely considered technical interoperation on a network level, because in order to send, you know, exchange sufficient information for encryption, uh, check certificates, this and that, some sort of data exchange is necessary. It's just necessary due to the functionality of the service. And you could thereby well, fabulate implied consent that you say if somebody's participating in the internet, then that somebody must also be fine with the way the internet is commonly working. So therefore such data may be transferred to exterior countries throughout the world. But let's see what, what things that will trigger in practice. So having discussed that actually quite interesting topic because this is very different from the way the GDPR is handling the data transfer. In particular, this proportionality possibility, I find very reasonable. We're now going to be handling essential requirements regarding interoperability in the articles 28 to 30. So data content and structures, formats and other properties, as well as technical means to access and ensure interoperability shall be provided by operators of data spaces, which again is not necessarily the data holder because an operator of a data space is not necessarily the same person who can ensure the access to the data. So uh, provide access to the data. So the data holder is the one who actually can get maybe the data from the data from the operator of a data space, but it is the operator of the data space who has to, for, to, to give you these contents and uh, content structures and formats and whatnot. Though here really the question is what happens with solutions where this operator of a data space doesn't have even access to these details because maybe the operator of the data space has delegated certain tasks to the data holder. After all, it's the data holder who shall make the data accessible, right? So again, a little bit of a new person, new player, new role participating in the whole thing and making it not less complex. Then you're having the, <laughs> the Corleone style um, specifications. The Commission is empowered to adopt delegated acts with specifications, in particular interoperability requirements for services and also in regard to smart contracts, in essence that's blockchain. So they want to have the power to have the power to impose future legal acts. We have seen that already throughout lots of legislation but of course it makes the whole thing a little bit more open-ended. Now, as to the authorities who will have the pleasure to handle all of this in practice, well, 
the role shall be provisionally fulfilled by the GDPR data protection authorities unless and until others are appointed by the member states. In that regard, I would like to remark that the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, only got this name provisorily, provisionally, in 1917 and kept it till 1997. So <laughs> let's see whether any other authorities will be really created. And I assume that just a lot of lawyers got a lot of new interesting tasks through this regulation. Then, yeah, Article 32 is stipulating the right to lodge a complaint individually or collectively. And now that's interesting because uh, it's not set necessarily through representation bodies. So I do wonder whether that is going to open a possibility akin to a class action lawsuit. And finally there we are having, you know, these are all sorts of scattered articles, the penalties provision, which however does not name the numbers. And it is the member states which shall determine appropriate penalties and whatever penalties they determine shall apply in addition and in parallel to GDPR penalties because don't forget this regulation also in parallel handles the provision of personal data and so to put this bluntly maybe the user can require his data under the GDPR in terms of a request for information or under the data act <laughs> So, let's say, well, that's going to be fun. Well, then we're having Article 34 in continuation of the Godfather <laughs> uh, stipulations. The Commission shall develop and recommend non-binding model contractual terms on data access and use to assist parties in drafting and negotiating contracts with balanced contractual rights and obligations. So you practically, again, cannot oppose that because you're not forced to use them. They are non-binding, right? <laughs> so you can't say anybody forced you to do something, but if you don't use them and have something owned and the something owned is deviating from them, of course, then you're getting into the interesting situation of maybe deviating too much and having an unfair and hence non-binding clause. And then we're having uh, the balanced terms, which will be interesting to see in terms of mass service to the public. Because in the end, if you're having the equivalence of a railroad with trains running on it, you will not be able to change uh, the rails just because of the whim of some customers. There will need to be certain one too many relations incorporated in such rules. On the flip side of this, maybe such regulations or guidelines or whatever else you see that as maybe even giving some legal certainty to providers. So let's see what is happening. Maybe not all is bad, maybe reasonable guidelines will come out. And then you, of course, it would be harder to challenge these as unfair because if the commission would deliver here a reasonable guidelines which do not chase away providers from the European Union, I mean, that should be something to be expected, right? then also maybe that will allow them a little bit of more legal protection against frivolous lawsuits of, uh, well, people who have nothing else to do. So may maybe that is going to have a positive effect. L let's see. Hmm? It's somehow as if the European Commission got the taste after the creation of standard contractual clauses for uh, the GDPR and is now of the opinion, wait a minute, we can create a lot further standard clauses. So let's see what happens. Maybe it's a good thing, right? Let, let's hope for the best. And then you're having this weird, um, yeah, sui generis database protection pursuant to the database directive. And here it is clarified that this right does not apply to databases containing data 
not build out of data, but containing data, obtained from or generated by the use of a product or a related service, and shall not in particular hinder data sharing as per Article 5. As this is, as I mentioned already in the beginning of this little legal analysis, something which is formulated as a clarification that may have some retroactive effects and maybe some indirect effects if you start considering what else should be clarified in an analogous fashion, right? And if you thought all of this is way too narrow and way too stringent, then rest assured that according to Article 41, within two years after the date of application of this regulation, the Commission shall review it, including with regard to other categories or types of data to be made accessible, excluding further enterprises as beneficiaries, that is, treating them like gatekeepers, hmm? or evil little dwarf companies partnering with gatekeepers, and reviewing contractual practices, charges, levied, etc. So, <laughs> the... the the, in, the regulations here under are not frozen in time, but you can actually expect this to mutate in the future further. So what can we say in summary? Well, I propose the following, but you can draw your own conclusions. The European Commission appears to be very determined to open to user control and broaden data access to and use of user-generated data, to ease switching products and services, and to prevent technical or legal lock-ins and imbalances. The practical effects on mass services and products open to the public remain to be seen. And that is indeed the end. So, thank you very much for having joined today. I know it was quite a ride and I hope you have enjoyed it. Hope to greet you again on this channel and I would be more than pleased if you were to become a subscriber. Until we meet again, I wish you a wonderful time and from me, thank you and goodbye.